Hey everyone, I'm Mr. Willis and you will love economics. Unemployment, what a bummer. It's the biggest hindrance of economic growth. When members of the labor force are not working, the economy loses the potential real GDP output that each worker could have produced with their time and energy. Essentially, we waste the scarce resource of labor and could be producing greater outputs of goods and services, meaning our real GDP output is growing slower than it should be, or could even be contracting altogether. This is why every economy focuses on preventing excessive unemployment. We measure unemployment in our economy with the unemployment rate. The unemployment rate is calculated by taking the number of workers who cannot find work divided by the total number of workers in the labor force. The unemployment rate illustrates the percentage of the members of the labor force who are willing and able to work but cannot find a job at the equilibrium wage in the labor market. For example, let's say a small country has a labor force of 10 million people and 1 million of those workers currently cannot find a job. This country's unemployment rate is 10%. Workers who factor into the unemployment rate must first be counted as part of the labor force. To be included in the labor force, a worker must meet certain criteria. First, they must be at least 16 years old. Otherwise, we'd have a lot of lazy first graders out there jacking up our unemployment numbers. Come on, you're eight years old, get a job already. Also, you cannot be a full-time student. If you're a high school or college student, you are not counted in the labor force and therefore don't count as unemployed, even if you are looking for work and cannot find it. A majority of your time is already devoted to acquiring human capital in order to become a more productive worker in the future. You cannot be an active duty member of the military because technically you already have a job, working for the United States government to provide national security for the American people. You also can't be retired because, well, you're officially retired from work. You cannot be institutionalized, meaning you're not counted as part of the labor force if you're hospitalized or you're in prison. And, most importantly, you must be both willing and able to work. If you are desperately willing to work but unable to do so, either because of a physical or mental handicap, you are not counted as unemployed because you simply can't participate in the labor force. If you are able to work but are unwilling to work because living with mom and dad and eating Cheetos on the couch while playing Call of Duty all day is just too much to give up, then you are not counted as unemployed. You have to be willing to work to be counted in the labor force. And if you're not a participant in the labor force, you're technically not unemployed. There are three types of unemployment. The first is frictional unemployment. Workers who are frictionally unemployed are temporarily out of work or in between jobs. These workers could have been fired or are seeking a new job or quit their job to change fields and are putting out applications. Simply put, these workers are qualified and skilled, and their skills are transferable to many other fields, but they currently aren't working. Frictional unemployment tends to increase and decrease during certain times of the year, because the nature of some jobs is directly tied to seasonal changes. This is known as seasonal unemployment. Santa Claus and Easter Bunny impersonators are in high demand during the Christmas and Easter seasons. But come December 26, Santa is let go and he becomes frictionally or seasonally unemployed until he finds new work in another field. The day after Easter, bye bye bunny. He's seasonally unemployed until he gets another job. The good news is, because the seasons always return, so do the jobs. So seasonal unemployment is temporary. The second type of unemployment is structural unemployment. Workers who are structurally unemployed have lost their jobs because their skills have become obsolete due to some structural change in the labor force. Unfortunately, these workers' skills are non-transferable, meaning that they cannot be used in another field. And therefore, these workers are useless to the workforce until they can acquire new skills to meet the evolving labor force. As a result, when a worker becomes structurally unemployed, their jobs never come back, meaning a worker will remain unemployed until they learn how to do something new. Structural unemployment happens periodically throughout history, as the human workforce is replaced by innovative technology that has surpassed the productivity of human workers. This is a type of structural unemployment known as technological unemployment. It is inevitable for firms to automate as technology advances 
and replace human workers with physical capital that has surpassed human productivity. In fact, this type of automation is mandatory if any economy is to promote long-run economic growth. Unfortunately, it results in humans being replaced by machinery, making human jobs obsolete because a machine can do it better. This is a phenomenon called creative destruction. For example, carriage makers at the turn of the 20th century became obsolete when the horse-drawn carriage was replaced with the automobile. In order to find new work, the carriage maker needed to learn new skills and find work in a new field of occupation because the old job was never coming back. And until he found work, he was structurally unemployed. The third type of unemployment is cyclical unemployment. Workers who are cyclically unemployed have lost their jobs because of a downturn in the business cycle. As the economy contracts, real GDP output will decrease because consumer demand decreases, leading firms to produce less. This lowers the demand for labor, meaning workers are fired and unemployment increases. During the Great Depression, as the unemployment rate skyrocketed to 25%, a vast majority of that unemployment was cyclical unemployment, as the severe contraction in the nation's economy meant firms slowed their production and fired workers who were no longer needed. The good news is, the workers who lose their jobs due to cyclical unemployment will see those jobs return as the economy begins to grow and economic conditions begin to improve. As the economy heats up and consumer demand increases, firms will begin to increase their production levels and they will demand greater numbers of workers, eliminating cyclical unemployment. Cyclical unemployment is also entirely preventable. Policies can be used to promote real GDP growth or correct economic contraction, which minimizes the severity of cyclical unemployment that an economy experiences. On the business cycle, cyclical unemployment is visible as the space between the trough and the growth trend line. Closing the trough eliminates cyclical unemployment. All right, so what are we waiting for? Let's get to 0% unemployment by eliminating frictional, structural, and cyclical unemployment. Except, that's not possible. There are two types of unemployment that are unavoidable, frictional and structural unemployment. Economists agree that at any given time, 4 to 6% of the labor force is either frictionally or structurally unemployed, and there's nothing we can do about it. How do we prevent someone from being late to work and getting fired, or from quitting their job to apply for a new one? How do we prevent time from making skills obsolete? It's just not possible, and it's out of our control. As a result, the 4 to 6 percent of frictional and structural unemployment that take place at any given time in our economy is considered our natural rate of unemployment, meaning 4 to 6 percent unemployment is considered an optimal unemployment rate. Economists use the 4 to 6 percent natural rate of unemployment to gauge where we are in the business cycle. If the unemployment rate exceeds 6 percent, this indicates that there is excessive cyclical unemployment occurring in our economy, and our real GDP output is most likely contracting. If our unemployment rate is below 4 percent, our economy is growing at a rate that is not sustainable, which could lead to excessive inflation and eventually economic contraction. As a result, because some frictional and structural unemployment cannot be prevented, 4 to 6 percent unemployment is the target we aim for when it comes to our unemployment rate. The unemployment rate is the most accurate way to measure joblessness in our workforce. However, many economists criticize its accuracy for various reasons. First, the unemployment rate does not include disgruntled job seekers who have given up looking for work. If a job seeker is unable to find work over an extended period of time, they can become frustrated and give up looking for jobs altogether. When they give up looking for work, they actually withdraw from the labor force, causing the unemployment rate to decrease, leading us to believe that more workers have been hired in the economy. When these frustrated job applicants decide to give it another go and look for work again, they reemerge in the labor force, which can actually cause the unemployment rate to rise, giving us the impression that jobs have been reduced and workers have lost work. Another criticism is that the unemployment rate does not consider underemployment. A worker is considered underemployed if they take a job for which they are overqualified, or they work part-time for a smaller salary than they are capable of earning. Underemployment occurs because frictionally unemployed workers need income. And out of desperation, they take a job for which they are overqualified, or they get paid less than they are worth. Imagine a worker with a PhD working as a waitress. She has the ability to solve equations in advanced biochemistry, but she's working part-time at Chili's, 
waiting on tables and refilling bottomless chips and salsa to pay the bills. She's in a terrible situation and her human capital is being wasted, but technically she's employed. The unemployment rate can be low, but it does not reflect the hundreds of thousands or even millions of workers that may be underemployed. The unemployment rate also doesn't reflect age, race, and gender inequalities in the workforce. The unemployment rate illustrates joblessness in the aggregate workforce, but it hides the fact that certain groups suffer from higher rates of unemployment due to secondary traits and characteristics. For example, ethnic minorities tend to have higher unemployment rates than white workers. African Americans tend to have a higher unemployment rate than any minority group, and it typically runs 3 to 5% higher than the national unemployment rate. The unemployment rate for teenagers runs much higher than the national rate, at times a staggering 10% higher. Firms tend to assume that teens are less mature and less productive than their older competitors in the labor market, and so they are less likely to be hired when applying for the same jobs as older applicants. Women tend to have a higher unemployment rate than men, although that gap is slowly closing. Any combination of these criteria will dramatically increase the unemployment rate for job applicants. For example, young African-American women tend to have the highest unemployment rate of any subgroup in the American workforce. Higher unemployment rates among subgroups means that it is harder for those groups to earn income and therefore meet their needs and wants. This can put these groups at a significant economic disadvantage which is one of the reasons why we try to eliminate discrimination in the workforce. And that's unemployment. Be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red button below so you can receive alerts about new videos when they become available. If you enjoy the channel or find my videos useful, let me know by liking the video and feel free to leave a comment below. We have full video lectures on every topic in macro and microeconomics, as well as quick macro and micro minute videos for cram sessions and quick reviews. If you'd like to learn more, you can click here for my Macro Minute video on Creative Destruction, and you can click here for my Macro Minute video on Oaken's Law. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time on You Will Love Economics.